We are studying regional economic integration. We know about the degrees of economic integration. That's what we studied in the first lecture. In the second lecture, we looked at consequences of signing a free trade arrangement or an agreement with another country. And I defined what is trade creation and what is trade diversion. Now, let us look at the effects of regional economic integration and let us just focus on the positive side. The first thing is we distinguish between what are called static effects and what are called dynamic effects. Static effects are effects that happen at a point in time. Dynamic effects are those effects which happen over time. We have already talked about trade creation and trade diversion and larger the difference between these two on the positive side, greater is the beneficial, beneficial effect of signing a regional trade agreement. Number two, when you eliminate trade barriers amongst member nations, you are able to eliminate custom officials, border patrol agents, and so on. And this leads to a greater savings or lower government expenditures of these member nations. Number three, when different countries combine together, what they will have is a greater leverage or greater negotiating power with rest of the world as it relates to international economic or political relations. So these are the static effects particularly on the beneficial side, beneficial side of regional economic integration. What about dynamic effects? Now, when what I had emphasized in the previous video is, if the member nations should be complementary, should not be complementary in production, they should be competitive in production. And hence, when they sign and agreement which reduces or eliminates trade barriers. This will lead to increased competition and increased competition could be good in terms of innovations which can lead to cost cutting and also introduction of new and new products. So this is a big benefit uh, out of regional economic integration. Another thing is each member nation has a certain level of market in which it produces and supplies its products. But when it signs an alliance or when it becomes a member of a larger alliance, these production units have a larger market to cater to. And so what we see is the benefits of large scale production, something we had considered under the Helpman, Krugman, Lancaster model. The third effect, which again is a big one, is the inducement to invest on in foreign investments in these countries which have signed an agreement, free trade agreement with others. This also increases. How does it increase? Look at the following. Suppose we are looking at the European Union, which is an alliance between different European countries and the U.S., when U.S. exports something to the European Union, it's, it faces taxes or import duties. Now, in order to avoid these duties, what U.S. companies have done is they have established production facilities within the European Union. This process is called tariff jumping. And so what we have seen is a lot more foreign direct investment flowing into European Union from other countries. So there's a larger amount of investment that this alliance is able to attract. And last, and again an important one, is if when we open up our countries and we sign alliances with other countries, we can now use our resources efficiently, whether it relates to labor or capital. So these are the effects of regional economic integration on the positive side, the static, as well as the dynamic. Now let us briefly look at two successful examples of regional economic integration, the first one being the European Union. 
Now, after World War II, all European nations, they realized they are very small uh, individually. If you look at countries like France, Germany, UK, and compare them to the size of US, China, India, they are very small. And what they decided is they are going to remove all economic restrictions amongst all these countries located particularly in Western Europe. And so, and a European community was created by initially by six nations in 1957 called the Treaty of Rome. And then slowly different European countries joined this trade bloc. By 1968, what we had in Europe was a free trade area and they had removed all trade barriers or tariff barriers on trade amongst themselves. By 1970, they were successful in making it a customs union where they set common external tariffs against non-members. By 1992, in Europe, we saw the formation of a common market. They removed the remaining non-tariff barriers such as border control, customs and red tape and different standards, technical regulation and so on. And at the same time, they also permitted free movement of labor and capital. So Europe became a common market. And then by 2002, a European Monetary Union emerged and, and a number of countries decided to have a single currency called the Euro. So this is the brief stages of development of the European Union. The following table compares the European Union to NAFTA as well as China in terms of some key economic characteristics. Look at the following. In terms of population, we already know China is a heavily populated country. But how do US, uh, NAFTA and European Union compare? They are pretty close to one another with European Union having a little higher population than the US. What about total GDP or income generated in these areas? For China, it is lower. And for NAFTA and European Union, it is pretty close with NAFTA having a higher GDP. Then you look at this from the perspective of per capita income or per capita GDP. In China, it is much lower relative to what we have for the US and European Union. European Union and NAFTA are relatively closer to one another. What about exports and imports? Here you can see in the last two columns that exports and imports of European Union are much larger than what we have for NAFTA or for China. So given these characteristics and the fact that Europe, different countries in Europe combine together, now what they have is greater negotiating power with respect to the rest of the world. A lot of research has been done on the economic effects of the European Union. And just as an example, it has been estimated that the trade creation in the case of European Union exceeded trade diversion by a wide margin, more like 2 to 15 percent, depending on whose estimates you look at. We have also found tremendous amount of evidence that there were significant gains from access to larger markets. Why? Because of economies of scale. We have seen this in the case of footwear, steel, automobiles, copper refining, household appliances, etc. Another benefit has been greater competition amongst producers. And so whenever we have trade restrictions, it creates situations like that of monopoly. And when we have trade liberalization, it reduces monopoly and we have greater competition. And that brings down the cost and also improves the quality of products. This is the brief history of European Union. Now look at, let us look at another successful example called NAFTA or North American Free Trade Area. Now very briefly, in 1989, US and Canada created a free trade area. And in 1994, NAFTA was created, which is an alliance between US, Canada and Mexico. Look at the economic characteristics of NAFTA in 2012. 
and these numbers will help you explain the pattern of trait and the relationship between different members. The population of Canada, third, about 35 million, Mexico, 122 million, and US, about 314 million in 2012. What about the total income produced in each of these countries? Canada, 1.8, Mexico, 1.2, and US, 16.1. So you can see U.S. is the dominant economic power in this alliance, and Canada and Mexico are pretty similar. Average income per person in Canada about 52,000, for Mexico 9,700, and for U.S. 51,000. Now look at the interesting part. What are the wages as in dollars per hour? This is the total compensation. It's very similar between U.S. and Canada. Canada is about this much and U.S. is pretty close. What about Mexico? It's about one-sixth of the wages that prevail in Canada or in the U.S. Given the economic characteristics of different members of NAFTA and the different stages of economic development that they are in, we can figure out the gains and costs of NAFTA. From Mexico's perspective, Mexico gets greater access to larger markets and get gains in products in which it has comparative advantage given its lower wage or, or dominance of unskilled and semi-skilled work. And so Mexico gains in the case of apparel, textiles and clothing, field crops like tomatoes and so on, furniture and automobiles. What about the U.S.? U.S. go gains in products products in which it has comparative advantage and those are products and services which require skilled work. So U.S. gains the market of Mexico in financial services, chemicals, plastics and high-tech equipment. And what has happened to other countries which are not members of NAFTA? Asia is definitely hurt because of trade diversion because Asia happens to be a lower cost producer in general and so they suffer from problems of trade diversion. So these are some of the consequences of NAFTA. So we've looked at two successful examples of regional economic integration and if you look at the estimates of WTO or the World Trade Organization, it has 157 members and of these 157 members, they are a part of at least one of the 390 trade alliances that we have around the world. And here are some other examples of regional economic integration that has been tried in other parts of the world. One is for the entire continent of Americas. It's called the Enterprise for Americas Initiative. It has not been very successful. Then we also have Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. This is trying to become successful. So we have countries, uh, countries in Asia as well as countries like the U.S., which are members of APEC. Then we also had Central American Common Market. Mercosur is a trade alliance, I think, of three or four countries in Latin America. Then this was also tried in Africa and it is also being tried in Southeast Asia. Most of these have not been as successful as the European Union or NAFTA. The last thing about Brexit, in 2016 Britain decided to exit the European Union and why has it happened? Britain is a democratic country and we know whenever we have free trade some people are happy with free trade and some are not and in this case there was a movement again movement dominated by people who are unhappy with this alliance and hence Britain had to give up its alliance with European Union though most of the serious economists around the world felt that Britain is going to lose by quitting European Union. This completes our discussion of regional economic integration. Thank you for your time.